we go. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Goodman, a member of the USTA Middle States Leadership Development Committee. And this is the second iteration of our leadership series created by our committee under the leadership of Jim Flesh. The idea here is to produce interesting and engaging conversations with leaders from around our section. And in cases like today, one who's accomplished a great deal in our section and beyond. We hope these sessions are a little more casual than some of the other meetings you likely take part in every day while offering some thought provoking discussion and giving you a bit of an inside look at the many different personalities and stories in our sport. Now, many of you know Dan Faber. He's the executive director of the USTA Foundation, which has oversight of more than 250 national junior tennis and learning chapters nationwide. And he was the executive director of the NJTL of Trenton for eight years. Dan has earned several accolades, including the 2019 Racket Sports Industry Person of the Year, and he's a member of the Middle States Hall of Fame. Most importantly, he's a husband to Jennifer and a father to Sydney. Welcome, Dan, and thanks for joining us today. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me in Middle States. So, Dan, the, you got the background screen of the U.S. Open, which is a great place to start. I do happen to know that you're sitting in a basement in New Jersey, but I like the idea that, uh, that we see you at the U.S. Open. So why don't you start by giving us an update since the event is about two months away. What's the plan for the 2021 U.S. Open? Well, I think that's exactly right. I, we, I wanted to have this background just because of the excitement uh, that's, uh, that's happening here. As you know, you just have to turn on the news. Um, it appears that uh, New York City and all the surrounding areas are starting to open up. Uh, you just have to look at some of the other sporting events. So the U.S. Open is also tracking in that direction for full capacity. Not sure what that will quite mean yet, um, but as the foundation looks at that, um, it's going to give us a great opportunity. Uh, the, the U.S. Open is a time period that the, the USA Foundation has a chance to build a lot of awareness and, and raise the needed revenue that we use to support the NJTLs across the country and some of the other programs we do. And so to have the capacity of bringing in um, people to play in our events, uh, to entertain folks and meet new people is going to be huge and continue our efforts. So uh, no change though with the, the semi-annual meeting though, is it, is it, should we expect that that probably won't happen this year? I believe that's the, the case that it is not happening and that as we know it as usual. Um, I'm not part of that, that team, um, but I don't think uh, that's the direction that we're going at this time, correct? Makes sense. All right, so let's go back to Michigan where you were an athlete, enjoyed lots of sports as a kid, including tennis. Tell us about how the, the legendary Kirk Anderson and a coach named Dwayne Tusink, if I get the name right, influenced a young Dan Faber. You know, it's interesting you bring that up. Um, Tiger Tusink is his name. Um, and, and Tiger was probably the first uh, person in my life that really uh, inspired me to, to use the sport of tennis um, beyond just the tennis court. Uh, he was an unbelievable dynamic coach, and I think he was uh, inducted. He was inducted into the Coaches Hall of Fame. He was one of the first no-cut coaches. And in fact, my high school team had over 50 kids who played on it, and we filled two buses every <laughs> tennis match, no matter where we went, and we'd show up at some of these other high schools. Uh, and you should see the faces uh, of the other teams when you'd have 58 kids walking off of two buses. And what was unique about Tiger is that every single one of us played a match that day, some type wow. of match. Now, we might not have played against the other team. We'd play against each other, and we would stay late just for that sake. So that kind of mentality and that kind of um, vision has always inspired me. He was also a history teacher, um, and, and he just was so dynamic, and he, he showed how the power of education could influence someone's life also. So tennis and education kind of really – started in my life through Tiger um, and just having that mentor and that influence. Fast forward a little bit. Uh, when I was before high school, I was playing, I should say back, go backwards a little bit. Uh, sorry about that. Um, where Kirk Anderson was actually one of my first tennis coaches. So I should have started with Kirk Anderson, but he was the one who inspired me 
uh, to keep playing the sport because I wasn't really into it. It wasn't a sport that I thought I wanted to continue. I was more trying to follow my brother's footsteps and some of my friends through football and wrestling and others. But he was the one who kept me out there, maybe because he, he was my height. Uh, he, we were short <laughs> together. Um, but he's the one who kind of made tennis fun, David. Uh, and I think that was key. He knew how to get people excited about it. I'll never forget. He kept a binder back then. You didn't have photos, right? And he had a huge binder about this thick of photos of players who hitting certain types of shots. And in the middle of your practice, he'd run over there and he'd whip through about 400 pages of photos and show you exactly what he's trying to get you to do. He just made it fun. Um, so you never felt like you were grinding. You just felt like you were, you were competing and having a good time. So between that, and then you go into my high school years with tiger, uh, and what he did with as a tennis coach, he just the game continued to just be fun, uh, which inspired me to play it through college as well. It, it, it's obviously just so important about when you start playing a sport that it's that it's made fun. And obviously, Kirk and and from the way you described Tiger, they've just been doing that their entire life. Um, and I know that that um, you had said Tiger emphasized, you've said before that he's emphasized the importance of education. That combination of tennis and education seems to have stuck with you. Yeah, it has. It has, as, as, as you just said, uh, two very influential uh, coaches or, or mentors in my life about the sport of tennis. And then Tiger with education um, always said to me, you should be working with kids. You should figure out how to, how to at least leverage your ability of teaching others to do things. And so when I went to college, I thought I was going to go into business, but then I met another mentor, uh, another mentor from the local area where I went to school, who was a teacher, uh, encouraged me to change my major, which I did and became uh, a certified school teacher out of college. So I, I continued to play tennis at a division three level, changed my major and got my educational degree. And so those two worlds continue to just kind of come together. Um, throughout my life. Uh, when I graduated from um, college, I immediately got a teaching job, a fourth grade job in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, and then immediately became an, uh, an after-school coach um, and then helped out with the, the tennis team as well. So just that track continues. Um, and then I had an opportunity to move to the East Coast and really that opportunity is because my wife is from the, uh, the East Coast and she was finished with winters and she moved back <laughs> to the East Coast, so I had a choice. This was pre-marriage. Um, grow up and, and join her out there or, or stay in Michigan. And I, I made the decision to just take a little risk and I moved out East and met a, another person who influenced my life. And he was a principal in a local school district in Bucks County. And he said, you really should stay with teaching and coaching. And so I continued my teaching career in, in Council Rock School District in Bucks County because of this individual. and again, got, got involved with after school sports and coaching. And then somebody introduced me for the first time ever. And I did not even know what this was, was NJTL of Trenton. Um, another middle states or Bill Mountford. I ran into Bill Mountford, met him through other people. And he was really the first person I met when I moved to the East coast. He said, you should help us out at NJTL of Trenton. I didn't even know what NJTL was quite frankly. I didn't really know what USTA was at this point. Um, and so I got involved in the summer times as a volunteer, learned quickly what it represented, what it meant um, for kids and families who don't normally have access to this sport um, and educational help. And so uh, I thought it's something I could maybe help a little more. So I asked them, you know, if you wanted to, I could try to help get education a little more in depth uh, than it, what they were doing at that time. And so because of my educational background, I had a the ability to kind of talk to principals and teachers. And so I went into the Trenton Public Schools and started talking uh, what we could bring to their schools as an after school sport slash educational resource. Um, and it just grew from there, Dave. And um, again, tennis and education just kept colliding, just kept coming together. And then I uh, met the next very influential person in my life, which was Amy Smith. Amy Smith at the time was with the, was the board chair at uh, NJ Tell Trenton working with Bill Mountford. And they basically asked if I would consider uh, um, leaving teaching. Uh, there was a bold, bold statement they gave or question they asked me and, and come and just see if I could help do some things at NJ Tell Trenton. At the time, I just didn't think I could do that. 
starting a, fa uh, a family. That's when Sydney was, was born. Um, and as a teacher, it just gave a little better stability. So I tried to do both for a few years. Uh, I became then an administrator. It's called a teacher in charge at in Council Rock. And then at the same time, I was the program director at Trenton. Um, but I knew my passion was kind of moving more towards the, uh, the NJTL mission versus just public education alone. And uh, so fast forward from that, I did take a risk, uh, which is probably part of my DNA a lot. Um, let's see where the chips will fall. I, it's pretty calculated, but it is a risk. And I um, took a leave of absence from teaching. So it wasn't a huge risk at the time, but I was able to right. take a leave of absence and give it a shot. Um, I never looked back. Uh, three years later, I resigned from teaching and then I just took over the NJTEL Trenton for good. So going back to your earlier experiences with the NJTEL of Trenton, what led you to create the ACE curriculum? And, and, and if you can start by talking about what, what that is, what it, what it stands for and what that curriculum is. So when I started working more closely with NJTEL of Trenton, they were doing great things. Uh, they were operating in four different locations in the, in the city of Trenton and, and Ewing. And their educational component was mostly homework help, which was fine. It was great. It was definitely making a difference and it was helping. But we were only in one of the schools. And so, as I said before, I kind of came in and I started talking to some of the other schools to say, what will it take for us to, to bring our programs to you? And at that time, they said resources. So I did make a, a, a pledge that we would come into the schools and run it for free. But if it was something the kids liked the most and the teachers, eventually they would have to meet us either halfway or pay for the programming, which ended up being a success. But at the time, what we were doing is we were hiring uh, teachers to, to do science lessons or math lessons to complement what we were doing with tennis in the cafeterias and the playgrounds and so forth. What I noticed just as an educator is that the kids weren't very excited about it. Uh, they they kind of were thinking they were just doing, it was repetitive of what they just learned in the classroom. And quite frankly, it was. And the teachers are always tired. They work their tails off throughout the school day. And then after school, they just kind of were reteaching what they, they did earlier in the day. Um, and so nobody was too excited about the educational side of things. They loved the tennis, but the education was repetitive. So that just sparked an idea that we need to, we need to turn the educational part um, on and get it as, an, as an interesting as the tennis piece. And so I actually recruited uh, two of my fellow um, teachers that I used to work with in Council Rock, a former literacy specialist and a former math specialist. And I will never forget this day sitting at a Starbucks and looking at them and they're thinking, all right, Faber, what are you, what are you doing to us now? And I said, I have this vision. What we should do is take all of those great activities that we know work and that are fun um, and let's connect them to the sport of tennis and this is something that we could bring into the NJTEL of Trenton, where the teachers would feel more enthusiastic because we're handing them a user-friendly curriculum that they just have to follow. They don't have to think of something new. And the kids are going to have fun because it's not repetitive of what they just learned throughout the day. Um, and that's what ACE came from. Academic, at the time it was called Academic um, Creative in what did we say? ACE, academic creative engagement is what it ended up to, but it was academic creative uh, experiences, I think. And then we changed it to engagement. So that's what ACE is. And so we created this curriculum around math, science, and literacy in the sport of tennis. We turned the tennis court into an active classroom uh, with math, perpendicular, parallel lines, surface areas, and so forth. Uh, and then we also pulled in the, the importance of literacy and use Arthur Ashe and some of the prominent tennis players of the past as part of the way to get to know the sport and understand uh, how it's made a difference in other people's lives. We took That's that right. curriculum and, and we used it as our Girl Scout cookie. And so what we did is not only did it work for us in Trenton, we started leasing it to other NJTLs across the country. And so we started getting a residual um, revenue stream outside of just our typical fundraising. So it really worked well for the NJTEL of Trenton. That's how ACE was born. And at That's that great. time, the USJ thought it was kind of a, a neat product. I don't think they were too happy that I was leasing this product to these other <laughs> yeah. programs across the country. So fast forward a little bit, they ended up um, buying the rights to that actual curriculum. 
No, that's that's terrific. It's something to be very proud of. Um, so you mentioned after a few years, kind of doing it doing it part time, you're you're named executive director of the NJ Tale of Trenton. Now, fundraising, staff and volunteer management, community affairs, programming, all these things are part of your everyday life. You're you're leading an an organization. What was that transition like for you, and and what were some of your greatest initial challenges? You know, it's a good question. Um, the transition was actually easier than I even anticipated it to be. When I reflect what I learned and what I was able to do as a teacher, it's very similar to fundraising and running programs and evaluating them and actually running an organization. So I kind of had that leadership degree from my master's in educational leadership. So that kind of area was, was easy to transition to running a, a, an organization because I was doing that in teaching. But when it actually comes to fundraising, it's very similar to what a teacher has to do on a day-to-day -day basis. They have to sell education to kids who most likely don't want to be sitting in that classroom at all times. <laughs> and so you have to think quickly on your feet. You have to be creative. Uh, you have to try to be dynamic and engaging in order for kids to want to learn, um, especially when you're teaching calculus or something like that or physics. You've got you've to have the ability, I guess, quote unquote, sell uh, to get kids. So if you can do that in a classroom, uh, chances are you can do that with donors and sponsors because you have to be passionate about what the mission is and you have to be able to read the room. You have to be able to articulate what you're selling and then basically persuade them that they should invest in what this is. They should learn more about it. So that transition really came from the classroom um, fundraising and programmatic. That's what a teacher does all the time. I'm creating lesson plans. I'm creating programs around certain content. And then you're evaluating. You're evaluating the impact that that content had on the, on the student's life and how they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and a quarterly basis and a yearly basis. So all of those things, David, I think were a natural transition into the nonprofit world. Makes sense. Uh, and it, and. The, the passion you mentioned is probably the biggest thing. If you have a passion it's for something- It's, it's, it's the number sell. one. It's yeah. the number one. I tell my daughter all the time, don't worry about what the career is. Don't worry about what, what the salary is going to be. You have to start with the passion and that will lead to doors that will open and you will get to where you want to be career-wise and salary-wise. Yeah. yeah. I know that the rejuvenation of Cadwallader Park is something you're very proud of. Uh, and I, I was I was- fortunate to be there on that opening day to see uh, the result of a lot of your work. Talk about what was involved in the process of making that happen, the relationship building, the community engagement, the public-private partnerships. I think it's, it's relevant to a lot of people listening here, especially those who are uh, leaders in, in local community tennis organizations. Yeah, that was, that, was, um, that was definitely one of the trophies that we should put up for NJTEL Trent to get that done. I mean, it was... Um, it's a it's a city park, but it's a historical park. Um, and you're talking about at the time there were six courts made of red clay that nobody maintained, um, but it didn't matter. It was very historical. Um, and so it was hard to to get approvals to do anything to even maintain the existing infrastructure that was there. But as I kind of said, there's almost like a theme coming out of here. Uh, it always takes one person, one influencer that you can connect with to help make that happen. And at the time, um, in addition to the Amy Smiths of the world that I just said, and, and the board of directors that we had, and, and let me just tell you some, some hardworking key staff uh, that we had in NJTEL Trend, Dave Haggerty emerged. Dave Haggerty was um, at the time um, looking to become the president of the USTA. He's in our section obviously and lives close to me and he is connected to a gentleman named Albert Stark and Albert Stark uh, grew up playing high school tennis at Trenton High but also on those parks and he said I like your vision I like what you guys are talking about let me see if I can help so we brought in Dave Haggerty we brought in Albert Stark both influencers in their own right in different areas um, and we created what I would say a pretty dynamic strategic plan that we brought to the city hall and said, this should be a public private partnership. Um, and this is what we'll deliver. And this is why it should happen. And, and, it, and it happened. Um, they matched us dollar for dollar pretty much. 
the USTA played a major role of coming in and helping us design it and, and making it look aesthetically right in the, in the settings. Um, but it, it took a lot of work, a lot of politicking, and a lot of the right influencers to get behind it for us to, to finish that project. Is that what you're looking for there? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's something that took took a long long time. But I think that the, the one thing that I, that I think is important is is for the people that are in that position and want to do something like that. Um, you didn't know Albert Stark, but you knew somebody who did. It, it, it's getting it's it's getting to people, but using other people to do it. And uh, I think that's an important point. Um, so. At this point, I should probably mention Jeff Harrison. I mean, it was bound to happen eventually. Um, Jeff has a way of getting people to do things. And he encouraged you to volunteer with Middle States, right? He did. It's interesting you bring that up because the circle <laughs> of life, and, 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 and that's a statement Jeff probably says more than anybody I hear, the circle of tennis life, the circle of life. And, um, and it truly is. You know, I, it's, if you look at my time with middle states which is continues today the people that uh i was connected to early on have been an influence or been a part of everything throughout this entire step in life for me um and where i am at this point i mean bill mountford still actively involved helps us out now at our pro ams and our tennis fantasy camps rob holland I hired, I can call him a kid because I hired Rob Holland out of college, uh, him and his tennis team for the first group of kids to teach at NJ Tell Trenton. Um, and Rob has stayed along my path throughout. When I left NJ Tell Trenton, he took it over as the executive director. Now I pulled him to the national level and he runs our Orlando office. Throughout that entire time, Jeff Harrison then was actively involved in the um, the section level, obviously, as a volunteer, and as we all know, as a president. And I remember uh, Jeff sitting down with me with some others and saying, you know, we're really trying to get a pipeline of leadership. We, we really, and it was actually Jill Font. And we like what you're doing at Trenton. And we think that, you know, if you're interested, we'd like to get you more involved at the uh, sectional level um, and, and as a volunteer. And so it was really because of Jeff and Jill Font that they got me interested at the um the section level um and so encouraged me to get involved and so then i was a presidential appointee from jill font at that time started serving um on the board and then i was re-elected to the board um and really then learned more about what the usta was because again i didn't know a whole lot about the usta or what njtl represented as i started this process um, that then got me interested at the national level. Um, so I served on some national committees, um, just like a lot of us probably on this call do, uh, learn more about what that meant. And so all of that was very, very important because when this position opened up eight years ago, I then had some historical knowledge and some understanding of the infrastructure of this very complex organization right. from staff, volunteers, and different levels of that. And so now, fast forward, the foundation uh, started experiencing rapid growth, which allowed me then to build my own infrastructure and bring on new staff. Um, I was looking for a development director, and that's not an easy thing to find, especially when you're trying to sell the sport of tennis. Um, it's not like we're we're curing cancer or we're you know the the next best thing for diabetes. We're, we're certainly an important piece of all of that because of health and wellness and what we do, but you got to find somebody who can understand the sport of tennis and everything I just explained to then be passionate enough to sell the mission. And we hired a search firm. Within 12 months, I think the search firm wanted to fire me because I just couldn't align around anybody that they kept bringing to me. Uh, and it just didn't feel right. It never made sense. They were institutional candidates, people who ran universities and hospitals do wonderful things, but that's not the same is really being out there trying to promote and sell the sport of tennis and how that can impact his lives. And so um, I was frustrated. Jeff Harris and I somehow connect. I said, let's grab lunch, you know, circle of life, right? Started telling him about how frustrated I was, telling him about what I was looking for. And I'm just hitting a dead end and I'm just going to have to continue to do this. Long story short, 
towards the end of the launch, I finally just looked at him. I said, I'm trying to find somebody like with your mentality, you know, that, that ABC mentality, just always be closing in mine. And I just can't get in. It finally dawned on me. I looked straight at him. And I'm like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> and so, you know, the timing was perfect. So uh, Jeff kind of looks at me, he goes, here's that circle going again. I said, would you consider it? Uh, he considered it. And uh, he's been with us now for, I think now close to five years, um, being part of what we've been trying to do. And as I said, Rob Holland joined as well uh, to be a part of what we're doing. And so the foundation um, still stays connected to USA right. Middle States, even though it's a national organization. It's kind of neat. So for the, um, going back to your, your, your involvement in the section and even nationally, for the benefit of the many Middle States volunteers who are listening today, talk about how taking on a leadership role in the section contributed to your success professionally. Well, as I said, the organization, it's a, it's a complex structure, right? Um, there's great, great opportunity as a volunteer to have an impact. You don't see that in a lot of professional sports. Um, and so when you're on the staff side of things, to have the understanding of what a volunteer does in the USTA and what they can contribute is very, very valuable. Um, and I, so by me being on the USTA Middle States board, I had a chance to learn that side of the business, um, mm -hmm. to understand all the intricacies about how all that comes together and what that looks like, and then how that guides what's happening at the staff level, at the district level, the section level, states, right? And so when I decided to throw my hat in the ring for a national position, I kind of had that in my toolkit to be able to talk to it, where somebody from outside of our, our family, outside of our industry, wouldn't. Um, and it's a hard one to describe, but when you're in it, it totally makes sense. Sure. All right, so I want to get to some stuff about the foundation. So when you joined the USTA Foundation, then known as USTA Serves, I think, was um, 2013, 2013, they're raising about one and a half million dollars a year and funding many programs, but some would say without a measurable impact. Now, fast forward uh, to 2020, you're raising nearly $10 million a year. How are you putting that money to work and making it count? Well, you know, we should look at this in two ways, right? 2020, which is unique to any year, probably in history, well, in history, <laughs> it's uh, the pandemic. How did we make the money work? Uh, we actually in 2002, and then I'll look at it outside of 2020. But when the pandemic hit, just like everybody, um, we had to pause first and just figure out what was happening and where is this going to go? The best strategic plan that you could have in place just got completely thrown out the door. Um, and so we did, we did the same thing that a lot of people did. We just paused for a second and just kind of under, try to understand what was happening and what would that mean then for our clients, which are NJTLs out there in the community, knowing that the NJTLs were going to begin get hit hard from this. If everything had to shut down, no fundraising, um, no ability to, to articulate what they're dealing with. It's going to be a struggle, a challenge. And at the same time, at the national level, we're looking at the same thing. No U.S. Open potentially. What does that mean to our budgets? What does that mean for headcount staff and so forth? Um, and then we were hit with a third thing. As, as many know, we, the company went through a reduction in force. So you add all those things together where we were losing staff and, and no one knew really where we were headed um, and, and what all that meant. It was important to just pause to be more strategic, but not too long. And so the foundation team, which I give all the credit to, came together and we spent a lot of time discussing what is it that we should be doing in order to help our NJTLs and help the mission of what we have to accomplish. So we quickly turned our fundraising into a campaign. And that's where we came up with Rally to Rebuild we knew we were going to have to help rebuild this network or at least sustain the network. And so every single thing that we had on this incredible strategic plan turned into basically one-on-one -on -one discussions 
explaining to them what our, our hopes are to do for the 2020 year and get them to buy in what Rally to the Rebuild meant. That meant going to those who usually pay to play in our pro-ams and our fantasy camps and our, you know, our cultivating events and ask them, would you just contribute unrestricted directly to this campaign? That was going to the U.S. Open sponsors that support us in some ways. We're not going to be able to do this activation because of what's happening, but would you still contribute what you would have unrestricted to this campaign? We went to foundations that were you were restricted the way you wrote the grant, and we asked them, would you unrestrict it? Amazingly, David, almost all of them did that. Um, and so we set a goal of raising $4 million, bringing that down, and we ended up raising close to $7 million because of it. But then what we did is we took that same mindset mentality and applied it to how we were going to disperse the monies. We asked our clients, Rob Holland and his team went out and had numerous one-on-one -on -one phone calls. I think they called every single NJTL leader one-on-one. -on -one. And then we also had group meetings. We, you know, when I say meetings, there were the Zoom meetings, sure. right? Um, and we quickly heard from our client what was happening. And so we took all of our services and put them on webinars like everybody else so that we can continue to help train and guide wherever they needed. And then we dispersed almost in a similar way as a PPP fund, right? Where people could apply to us for unrestricted dollars just to help keep their doors open or maintain key staff so that when the world would reopen, they would be ready to at least engage into that. And so we were pretty successful. I mean, our stats show that not one chapter uh, went out of business during 2020. Now, a couple of them merged, but nobody truly went out of business because of the disbursements of funds we were able to give from that campaign just to maintain them. And then also the technical assistance we provided, um, at least our indicators show that close to $10 million was raised in PPP stimulus funds. And we wanna feel that we helped with that because we gave web webinars and the USTA national right. staff helped us put all of that together. So that was 2020. I mean, that was truly unique. Yeah. But what I think came out of that that was very special is, is everybody's leadership abilities and everybody's passion to pivot quickly and to try to still make a difference. So now moving forward, I'm interested to hear the foundation's goals for the next couple of years, but also about how, how you are, your approach to leading the organization to those goals. And, and for those watching and listening, by the way, we got probably a couple more questions, then we've got some um, some of your questions that we'll get um, to Dan as well. Repeat then what, repeat the, my goals, is that what you're saying? Yeah, so I'm interested in the foundation's goals for the next couple of years, but in, in, in about how your approach to leading the organization towards those goals. My approach to leading, I think, you know, um, I think my approach, it would be interesting to get someone's perspective who works for me, that what my approach might be, um, is probably somewhat my approach, right? Um, I try as best I can to listen to, to the staff that works with me. Um, I try to empower them to make business decisions. Um, and because I can't do it alone, nor should I do it alone. Uh, and, and so for me, when we put goals in place, I want to make sure that I have the most trustworthy, hardworking, and dedicated people on my team. Um, everyone laughs. I know it's an old statement, but I, I have the ABC mentality, you know, always be closing. And I talk about that with everybody on my team, no matter what it is, how small it is, how large it is, you should always be thinking, how do I close this? And then the A and the B can act as something other than always be. It can be the big one for me is attitude. How do you maintain a positive attitude, um, an aggressive attitude, but professional? And B is the behavior of all of that, right? And then C is communication. Um, we know in the last year, communication was probably the hardest piece of everything that we were doing. But it's important as a leader for me to keep that culture going, keep the communication going, and ultimately keeping the ABC mentality intact um, isn't easy. And it hasn't been easy, but I, I do think um, my team has exhibited that throughout this entire pandemic and continues to do. So 
I guess that would be my style is to continue to um, push people, but let them drive themselves to where it needs to go. So last question from me before we get to a couple questions from others. Um, anyone who knows you knows that you're a dedicated family man. Talk about the importance of work-life balance and how you keep the scale from tipping too much to the work side. Well, fortunately I am in my basement because if my wife or daughter heard this, you might get a different answer. Um, <laughs> and, and I do get lectures from them quite a bit. You know, it, work life is extremely important. Um, I'm at a different point in time right now because my daughter is older. Uh, we have one child. Uh, my wife works also. Um, and so my time for work is a little more than it would be when my daughter was a baby and young and so forth. Um, and so work is um, in my DNA. It always has been. I, I, I was raised in a family with a very strong work ethic. Um, I do think I need to balance it a little better. I need to know how to shut it off. But, you know, let's go back to the word passion. I just become, I think, so passionate about what we're doing and what we're trying to do as a, as a team um, that it's hard for me to completely shut that off sometimes. And in fact, I enjoy it. You know, somebody will go on a trip and they'll want to read a book. I want to go on a trip and, and just kind of read, uh, uh, try to rewrite the mission statement or try to think of more values to add to the content of what we're doing uh, because it's just part of what I enjoy doing. Um, but I always, always encourage my staff to find times to shut down. So Rob Holland's on vacation right now. If he's watching this, shame on you. You shouldn't be watching this. Um, those kinds of things. I think we're getting better at it. I think the pandemic has also taught the importance of finding that balance. Um, and I do my best with, with my team if there are opportunities to include your families on what we do. And, you know, if there's, we're doing something at the U.S. Open and there's an opportunity to, to have your significant other or one of your children join us at something that's appropriate, uh, I think that's a hidden bonus to do for people um, so that they see how you work, why you're working and be right. a part. And Rob Holland, I believe is on here because I just got a message, but he did say he's jogging while he's watching. So I'll give him a little credit. <laughs> well, hello, Rob. All right, uh, Michael, um, I know there's a couple of questions that were sent in before or you're getting today. So uh, start us off. Yeah, definitely. So, um, Dan, we got a, got a few we can run through here real quick. One's from your uh, your old uh, Trenton friend, Michelle, uh, who asked, now that we're uh, recovering from COVID, getting back to regular programming, what advice can you give to smaller organizations or startups looking to scale and uh, make a difference in their communities through tennis? Well, first of all, hi, Michelle. I, 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 have, I do follow Michelle a little bit on LinkedIn and some of her Facebook thing. And congratulations to Michelle. I believe she started her own um, company, like um, um, counseling kind of coaching kind of company and, and, and helping kids get to college and so forth. She, she's gonna do a great job at that. So congratulations to her. And I wanna think NJ Telf Trenton inspired her to move in that direction, but I'll let her answer that someday. For the smaller chapters, um, in order to, to grow, I think, what I would like to see in a smaller chapter is less is more. Um, really look at what you were able to do to, to, to just stay um, stable during 2020 and why you were able to, to stay stable because of that. And so I wouldn't jump, you know, shoot out of the gates trying to do anything and everything just to grasp at money, just to grasp at the ability to grow. I would move forward on what you do best. And that might be um, just tennis programming at the moment. Do that and do that well and getting more kids involved in the game. If education is your sweet spot, figure out then how to do that better. But then ultimately, you're going to have to listen to your constituents, listen to your board of directors, listen to your donors. This is a chance, I think, for everyone to reset a little bit. But in order to reset, you got to go to your donors. You got to go to your, your supporters and ask them, what is it that you want to see us do? Like get engagement of those folks, because I think people are hungry to get engaged again. 
All right, gotcha. We got we got another good one here, Dan. Um, this is from Ron from uh, Ron Rose from Lawrenceville, uh, asking about just uh, maybe your greatest uh, accomplishment or one of your favorite accomplishments from the foundation so far, and then um, maybe even something you've you've struggled with or, or something that you've been working on that haven't been able to get accomplished yet. Ron Rose, nice to hear that name. Uh, Ron was a board member at NJHL Trenton uh, during my time and um, another very passionate person about the sport of tennis and helping others. Um, and in fact, he supports another charity in, in his homeland as well. So good to hear that name. At the USA Foundation level, um, the accomplishment I think I'm, I'm very happy with and proud of would probably be um, rebranding and restructuring the foundation. So I was hired in 2013 and within at the end of the year and within those first three months, which is the fourth quarter uh, of 2013, it was very clear to me that the foundation um, needed a little more structure and the ability to, to tell a story better if it was going to raise more money. It was very just broad in all categories, the way it dispersed dollars, the way the mission was written, the board of directors, there was 45 board members, none of them knew each other. They really only came together during the US Open. And so that allowed me an opportunity. Remember, I, my theme has been find that one influencer, find that one key person to, to support you. Um, and that was Tom Chen at the time. Tom Chen, who uh, was the president when I was hired. Well, actually he wasn't the president, I was hired. And then we helped help him become the president he played a major role in restructuring the board of directors. So we went from 45 members down to 15, and then there was up to 25 advisory board members. That was key because now I could get a vote. It wasn't unwieldy. Um, it was easy to get a quorum. And so then we had people who still wanted to be involved that didn't want to go to every meeting. And we had then those people who were the voting fiduciary members. And then we had an opportunity to change the entire look of the foundation. So as David said, it went from USA Serves to USA Foundation. That made sense because when I said USA Serves, most people said, what is that? You say USA Foundation, you kind of know what it is. We changed our tagline. We went to serving up dreams, very easy, something to say. And then our mission statement went from about four to five sentences to one, combining tennis and education together to change lives. Everybody can memorize it and make it happen. So we did a lot of work behind rebranding the foundation, resetting the board, uh, and then redesigning the, the staff as well, um, is what we did. And so, you know, I want to believe that all of that work was not easy. Um, it took a lot of time and strategy and politicking to get to that. As David said, we, you know, the, the foundation at that time was raising just about $1.5 million and in 2020, um, our, our 990 shows about 11 million. So it can show you that that rebranding, that restructuring really played a role. And that probably the most important key piece of that is that during that time frame, we were able to take the NJTL network and embed it under the umbrella of USA Foundation. And that was huge because it turned the USA Foundation from an operating foundation to a delivery foundation, which basically means now we have programming to talk about, to measure and influence versus just trying to raise money and disperse it. And so that was a game changer by bringing the NJTLs into the fabric of the USA Foundation. I think if you, uh, if you asked a lot of the NJTL leaders and the leaders at the USTA, the biggest accomplishment uh, in the last eight years was hiring Dan Faber as their executive director. Um, that's all the time we have today. Thank you to everyone joining us online. A reminder to our USTA Middle States volunteers that we'll soon announce our next leadership series event. So please stay tuned for that. And if you're taking notes but missed something today, look for an email in the next few days from USTA Middle States that will contain a link with the audio and video from this conversation. Dan, thank you very much for your time today, your inspiration, your leadership lessons, and for the great work you do. We wish you, your family, and the foundation all the best, and uh, have a great day, everybody. Thanks, David, and, and, and thanks to Jim for putting this together. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody.